Admiral Kusaka replied, In the past we have often been remiss in not letting the commanding officer on the scene take action on his own authority. We want you to plan ahead of time in your own mind, so that without waiting for orders you will be able to do what is best in light of the overall plan and in response to changing conditions. Of course, the staff at headquarters too has prepared plans against an emergency. The young captain of one of the destroyers grilled Admiral Kusaka's entourage. If, as the parting words of the chief of staff of the combined fleet indicate, the power of the Imperial Navy is really to be marshalled for this one battle, then why doesn't Admiral Toyoda himself venture out from his bunker at Hiyoshi and assume direct command? He was voicing the innermost thoughts of the entire crew of this special attack task force, what are the prospects for Operation Tenichigo? The vehement debate among the officers continues. Those arguing that it can only fail are in the overwhelming majority. The confluence of various conditions foreseeable when Yamato sails, the American reconnaissance, unprecedented in its thoroughness. The huge and powerful task force that our intelligence confirms is waiting for us in the vicinity of Okinawa. The critical disparity in naval air power unprecedented in large battles on the high seas. In addition, doubts about the time of sailing and the course, that we will be as vulnerable as a man walking alone on a dark night carrying only a lantern, that we will be hit by submarines as soon as we enter Bungo Channel, or that midway we will fall victim to airborne torpedoes. This prediction, subscribed to by a large number of the young officers, will prove to be precisely on the mark. Against this sharp contention that the mission is doomed to fail, Chief Officer of the Watch Lieutenant Usubuchi, Chief of the First Wardroom, binoculars fixed on the sea at dusk, speaks in a low voice, almost a whisper. The side which makes no progress never wins. To lose and be brought to one's senses, that is the supreme path, Japan has paid too little attention to progress. We have been too finicky, too wedded to selfish ethics. We have forgotten true progress, how else can Japan be saved except by losing and coming to its senses? If Japan does not come to its senses now, when will it be saved? We will lead the way. We will die as harbingers of Japan's new life. That's where our real satisfaction lies, isn't it? Lieutenant Usubuchi's firmly held opinion becomes the general conclusion of the serious discussion continuing day after day in the wardroom. No one is able to refute it, as indications grow that the sortie is imminent, the pervasive anguish and distress of the younger officers cannot but give rise to many arguments. It is already impossible to conceal the fact that this task force will be vanquished, that final defeat of Japan is simply a matter of time, but defeat for what reason, defeat under what conditions. What is more, we who stand in the front line are already on the brink of death, but death to what end, death to pay for what, death how recompensed. Those ensigns and lieutenants junior grade who graduated from the Naval Academy speak as if with one voice. We die for the nation, for the emperor. Isn't that enough? Do we need anything more than that? Can't we die content with that? An officer candidate schoolman colours and asks in return. We die for sovereign and country. I understand that, but isn't there more to it than that? My death, my life, the defeat of Japan as a whole— I'd like to link all these with something more general, more universal, something to do with values. What the devil is the purpose of all this? That's nonsense. That's a useless argument, a dangerous argument. Isn't it enough to wear on your breast the chrysanthemum emblem of the special attack force and to die with a long-live the emperor on your lips? If that's all there is, I don't like it a bit. There has to be something more. In time it turns into a rain of fists, a free-for-all. Okay, we'll have to thrash that rottenness out of you. The position expressed by Lieutenant Usubuchi succeeds, just before the mission, in restraining the debate and saving the situation. Entering hostile waters at long last, the vanguard of the task force is about to reach mid-channel. From here on, we will be in hostile waters. To starboard, Kyushu. To port, Shikoku. Yet the enemy controls the sea, controls the sky. The ships are deployed in a formation used for sailing at night under submarine threat, Yamato in the centre and Yahagi bringing up the rear, and 2,500 metres separating each ship from the next. We begin radar watch for submarines. It will be conducted the whole night through. Fight with all our might, that is all we can do. I go to the upper radar compartment, steamy from the heat of the equipment. It is heavy with the odours of humanity.
Four off-duty sailors sleep, piled up in a dark corner. How many hours of life do their bodies have left? A few. A dozen or so outside, mouldering like mud, they sleep oblivious. Is their exhaustion already so severe? When I enter the instrument compartment, four men on duty are conducting a thorough search for contacts. They are calm, no different from the way they are during a drill. This ship's radar plot governs the movements of the other nine ships. Every movement of these men controls the entire task force from moment to moment. Now the consecutive days and nights of hard training are paying off, the vitality that fills their bodies, the cheerful confidence so apparent in their faces. Fortunate ones, they, listening, they detect on two different bearings what appear to be American submarines. When they turn our radar to these bearings, they also get weak contacts. First, they pick up in the receivers the transmissions sent out by the American radar. Then they confirm their finding by sending out transmissions intermittently in the same direction. If we transmit first, we inevitably reveal our position. By doing it this way, we hope to ascertain the movement of the enemy, while keeping him from ascertaining ours. Two submarines, or three, apparently the ones that have been in contact all along, we repeatedly take urgent evasive action dictated by the positions of the enemy submarines. Because it is night time, optical instruments are virtually useless. All we can do is turn our hydrophones in those directions and get ready for the sound of torpedoes being fired. If we hear that sound, we can plot their course from the intensity, direction and speed of the sound and try to dodge them, submarines, appearing so soon in mid-channel. Even judging only from their skillful and quick shadowing, it is clear that the American offensive is no ordinary one. We must be ready to be the target of torpedoes coming from all directions. The intelligence unit in charge of monitoring enemy communications intercepts an urgent radio communication from an American submarine to the flagship of the task force and to United States Pacific headquarters on Guam. It is not in code but in plain language. Do the Americans hold us in contempt? or is code unnecessary because the contents are not much of a secret. Enemy task force headed south, at least one battleship and many destroyers, course 190 degrees, speed 25 knots. Moment by moment they report our progress in detail. I do believe we learn about our position faster from their side than from ours. The navigation officer with a wry smile, even though anticipated, it startles us that the tracking is so thorough. At 11.45pm, 15 minutes before I go on duty on the bridge, when I go on duty, I will relieve the chief radar officer, Lieutenant Omori. On the bridge, I will report the radar situation to the staff officers. Because this task is the focal point of the nighttime watch against submarines, it is more than enough responsibility for me. Pushing open the curtain that shuts off the radar room, I climb the ladder to the bridge, one step at a time. The fierce wind hits me. Dark clouds veil the moon, hide the moon. The night becomes darker still. Not one point of light in my range of vision. Only unending darkness, toyed with by the wind. My body flattens against the ladder like a sheet of paper. Wait. Say a last prayer here for those at home. A fine opportunity. Fail to make use of it, and there won't be another. If even a single person were to observe me, the sanctity of the moment would be profaned. My heart would not be in it. But when tomorrow's sun rises, it will already be too late. Glad I realised that now, thank goodness. Orienting myself according to the ship's compass course, and turning to face what I presume to be the direction of home, I grip the handrail tightly and bow my head. The rivets of the rail are icy against my palms, but inside my body I feel a flush of warmth. Father, mother, older sister, late brother-in-law lost in action a year ago. They stand clearly before me and the faces of acquaintances, teachers and friends pass before my mind's eye and fade, people I have met in my short life and cannot forget. Their images blanket my sight, and I pay my respects to them as if they really stood in front of me. They are colourless apparitions, but when they smile desolately, I recognise their faces, I am grateful to you, I whisper repeatedly instinctively. Your kindness in forgiving me for being as willful as a baby, in giving me companionship, I have gained the road to an easy death. Death is easy. You not blessed with death, you who are still forced to live, how will you endure all the days after tomorrow? 
The hardships of those days are beyond my comprehension, fleeing alone from having to endure them. I really deserve nothing from you, but please permit me to hope for one beam of light on my path, that you will have joy in the future, that you will have the blessings of a new life. Never underestimate how precious life is. I must not immerse myself too long in such thoughts. I raise my head and climb, holding onto the rail. A sudden gust of wind blows up and from the side thrusts me in through the entrance to the bridge. The bridge is, of course, under blackout. In the dim half-light there is high tension. There is virtually no movement. The figures are frozen, as in a shadow play. Each is rooted to his assigned post and engrossed in his duty. A pleasant sense of fulfilment prevails. Officers, junior officers, sailors, twenty in all, such and such degrees, such and such, the reports of direction and distance from the radar. Nothing new, the reports from the sonar, only these voices shatter the silence. For convenience in nighttime identification, fluorescent dots have been attached to the back of each cap. For the commander-in-chief, one dot, for the captain, two, for the executive officer, three, their pale glow illuminates the area immediately around them. If they move ever so slightly, the sight is as beautiful as points of light in a dream, bringing smiles to our lips. We are about to do battle. We are about to do battle. Tomorrow is the day of the battle. We must fight single-mindedly, with no second thoughts. We receive a message from the Chief of Staff of the Combined Fleet. Our special attacks are inflicting heavy damage on the enemy task force in the vicinity of Okinawa. No reaction from any of the staff officers on the bridge we advance into a region where we can navigate close to shore. We have made it this far without hearing the sound of torpedoes. The American submarines have confined themselves to scouting us, perhaps because they plan an all-out attack on the high seas. They have fired no torpedoes. This is almost more than we could have hoped for. As we approach Kyushu with its high rocky coast and deep offshore waters, we shift to navigation close to shore. Against submarines at night, it is the safest course, confining their attack to one side and making it difficult to get our range and bearing by radar. Column formation. Yahagi in the van, Yamato in the rear. We institute a condition two alert. This cuts in half the number of men on watch and enables them to rest by turns. A dark night, visibility is very poor. To guard against running aground, we use our radar to calculate the distance from ship to shore and proceed, hugging the coast as closely as possible. With Yamato's radar, the margin of error is less than 50 metres. Until we attack, everything must be this careful and exact. A precious vessel. Yamato is, of course, our principal offensive and defensive force. I report our distance from shore, moment by moment. How great this responsibility, with bated breath, I check my rising excitement, morning on the high seas, on 7 April's dawn. We pass through Osumi Strait. In circular formation, we continue west. Yamato at the centre and a distance of 1,500 metres between ships. Of the six zero seaplanes Yamato normally carries for purposes of reconnaissance, we left five in Kure. Now we catapult the remaining plane aloft and send it back to a base at Kagoshima. If we kept it here, the plane would have little chance of escaping the sad fate of going to the bottom of the sea. In accordance with operation orders, the sky above the task force holds no friendly aircraft to defend us. In the face of the powerful American reconnaissance forces, certain to have swung into action immediately after we did, the Naval Special Attack Task Force is stripped of all air support. From now on we will see no friendly aircraft. Some people think that even the support of 200 or 300 fighter planes would have virtually no effect against the overwhelming and furious attack of a total of 1,000 planes. On the new carriers like Amagi and Katsuragi, waiting at Kure, rumours flared that they were now to go into operation. Had they in fact put to sea, the best crews and fighter planes in the Kure area would have been annihilated, and with nothing to show for it. Twenty reconnaissance planes, sent up contrary to mission orders on the responsibility of the base commander at Kanoya, were reconnoitering some tens of miles ahead of the task force, though we did not know it. Soon after sunrise, they broke radio contact with the base and, still in that state, were engulfed by a swarm of planes of the American Combat Air Patrol. Having lost more than half their number, they headed for home. Admiral Ito's only son, a flight officer, was on duty as a member of one of the first-line crews. 
The Admiral must surely have foreseen that chances were good his son would take part in the operation. Indeed, it may have been his long-cherished desire that when the country's doom became imminent, father and son would take part together in a glorious suicide mission. Fulfilling his father's expectations, Lieutenant Ito took part in all the patrolling that was part and parcel of Operation Tenichigo and fortunately returned alive, but ten days later he flew to his death on Okinawa as a member of the Kikusui Special Attack Force. The son tries to protect the father and then chooses the waters nearby as the site for his own valiant death. Just at sunrise the submarines fade from our radar screens and in their place reconnaissance planes begin to shadow us. Submarines by night and planes by day. Usual reconnaissance practice, they pursue us, circling skillfully near the extreme range of anti-aircraft fire of each ship in the task force. If we see a chance and open fire, they duck the shots adroitly and then come in a bit closer to continue their pursuit. Here stands revealed the disadvantage of having no air cover. Ever since we sailed, they have had our every movement under observation. What is more, the ceiling is low, and visibility around 10,000 metres is very poor. More than once we lose sight of the planes tracking us. Not to mention the fact that it is impossible to locate the enemy task force early on. Weather conditions are extremely adverse. Flying above the task force a few planes at a time, formations of American fighter planes make repeated contact. Martin flying boats also join in. This shadowing operation has been carefully thought out. We begin anti-aircraft radar search. At every moment, reports come in on the range and bearing of the planes shadowing us, and we know precisely where they are. Still, how skilful their pursuit, sometimes boldly, sometimes circumspectly, taking advantage of the weather conditions to duck in and out among the clouds, they maintain contact. All ships are making 20 knots. At intervals of five minutes, we execute evasive manoeuvres, all ships simultaneously carry out a complicated zigzag, repeating the pattern every five minutes. Simply steaming straight ahead would reveal our course and make it easy for the waiting submarines to zero in on us. The zigzags conceal our course. On the right wing of the formation, a Sashimo suddenly begins to fall behind. She hoists signal flags. Engine trouble. A Sashimo soon grows small in the distance. She radios us that urgent repairs are underway, a follow-up message. Repairs will take five hours. Dropping out already? A grim premonition runs up my spine. The bridge is calm, as usual. The movements of the staff officers and the sending and receiving of signals are quite brisk, but that is all. The calm before the storm, breakfast, probably the last meal we can enjoy in a normal atmosphere. I cannot bear to eat it inside this gloomy compartment. I scramble up the ladder outside the radar compartment, come out atop the platform of the antenna used in sending out transmissions, a flat area a little more than two metres square. I take a big bite out of my ball of rice, an ideal spot, surrounded by sky. When the sea wind blows up and threatens to knock me off, I hold on by wrapping my legs around the support. I cannot keep this wonderful spot all to myself. I summon Petty Officer Katahira, a skilled radar operator, and we eat together, our knees bumping. He hurries through his meal silently and then departs with a stiff nod. His face betrays his impatience to be alone. Thirty-three years old and noted for his thorough grasp of the theoretical aspects of radar and high skill in its practice, he has left a pregnant wife at home. What is more, this is their first child, eagerly awaited. And yet father and child will never meet. The child will never feel its father's gaze. The father will die without having known his child's touch. Nothing whatsoever can be done about it. As his immediate superior, I censor his letters, and so I know all about the situation, and he knows that I know. Was he afraid that he was about to hear words of consolation from a superior officer younger than he and single? That would have been too humiliating. Had I been a fellow sailor struggling with the same thoughts, our consoling each other would have provided a moment of happiness. Gloomy and finicky fellow, should he die with his narrow-mindedness unchanged, he won't live on in his wife. I didn't want to console you. I know I'm not the one for that. I wished only to enjoy with you this last morning and this cool, refreshing, salt air. I have no wife, no children, of course. Only my parents and sister will mourn my death. I have not experienced the flames of love facing death. 
I am not bound by any ties whose breaking would drive me frantic. Petty officer Katahira and I, which of us is the lucky one, which the unlucky should I rest content that I am blessed with peace of mind, having only my own flesh and blood to mourn my death? Or is the true meaning of life to be found in heart-wrenching anguish like his? My eyes, staring vacantly while I am absorbed in thought, itch for sleep and are hot. The cool breeze bathes my eyes in pain, the morning sun, its dull yellow rays reflecting off the waves through gaps in the clouds, is dazzling but pleasant. With a happy heart I wonder, since I was weaned from my mother's breast and came to savour the morning meal, how many thousands of times, how many tens of thousands of times have I eaten breakfast? Breakfast? After today breakfast and I will be utterly without connection, I shake my head in disbelief. The sea is exceedingly blue, Heavy waves strike the side of the ship. The southernmost coast of Kyushu is already fading from sight astern. These eyes will not see again the fields and hills of home. Each moment they become more distant, and we are separating for good. Now not a single island is visible. Task force course, 208 degrees, roughly west-northwest. Even though the main island of Okinawa lies to the southwest, we are scheduled to make a long detour, advancing on this course to the halfway point to conceal our intentions and to avoid the main body of the American task force. Plan A called for an advance directly down the Ryukuan archipelago. Plan B called for a slight detour, and Plan C a wide detour. It is said that the discussion focused primarily on these three before Plan C was finally chosen. The task force is strongly opposed. The situation is clearly dire, with no room for such tricks, the best idea would be to proceed under cover of darkness at full speed, straight for Okinawa. We encounter a convoy of ships flying the Japanese flag, a convoy of several small transports. Where are they returning from? They pass us, threading their way through our formation, the hazy forms of the ships, their tired wakes, sad to think of the troubles they've experienced. At long last they are almost home, but what sacrifices have they made to get back this far? They signal to us in Yamato. We pray for your success, smiles fill the bridge, to receive parting wishes from a bunch of decrepit old tubs like them. We reply promptly, we will not disappoint you. On the decks of the passing ships, no sailors wave goodbye. They encounter Japan's last task force sortie, yet they stay below deck. How great their relief when they finally see the home islands close at hand, on board each ship in the task force, Eyes gazing after the transports as they fade in the distance. Eyes, a sense of desolation, so vivid it is almost hypnotic, a sashimo recedes farther out of sight. If a lone ship drops out of the task force, the American planes will inevitably focus on it. Something must be done, urgent consultations, a decision is made, at the point where we are to change course from west-northwest to south-southwest, we will steam back to Asashimo. Then, after reintegrating her into the formation, we will turn back once again onto the prescribed course. Asashimo's damage is said to be to one part of her reduction gear, about 9am. I go to the upper radar compartment, surface radar, Yamato's radar compartment happens to be off duty. The entire task force of ten ships is divided into two watches, and the two watches stand radar watch by turns. Relieved from duty, the sailors sit mute at their posts. Two older sailors squat, shoulders hunched, clouded eyes expressing bitterness. Their gazes fall fixed and unwavering to the deck. Discipline no longer holds. Because death makes them bold, or because death has ground them down to the point of exhaustion, they are no longer men under military discipline. They are simply individual human beings. What kicks in the pants? What whip on their backs? What words can call them to account for their poor form? Are they lamenting that this, the last of their many pleasures, is being taken from them, or weeping over the difficult days ahead for their wives and children? I distribute cigarettes, the ceremonial gift from the Emperor. I pass around a pocket-sized bottle of whiskey for a sip each, our last chance to enjoy ourselves as a group. Without even raising his head, Petty Officer Miyazawa reports, The equipment is in first-rate condition, sir. This mission caught him unawares, on the fourth day after his wedding. I'm thinking of getting married the next time we have shore leave. I'd like your opinion, sir. 
He asked me that a month ago, when we were in the midst of intensive training in the home seas. Having made sure of his prospective bride's home environment, her character, and how well they knew each other, I gave my approval immediately. I knew that the mission was approaching, but I never thought it would come this soon. I gave my approval with an easy mind, because these days the entire nation shares the fate of having death on the doorstep. His first words after the wedding. She really has a beautiful figure. His clumsy chatter about his sweetheart made him popular at once. Since leaving Cure, he had been more diligent than ever. There was no one like him. Even during short breaks, he never stopped tinkering with the equipment. Did he fear that letting up might bring a moment's idleness and force him to face the reality of the situation? A messenger boy calls delightedly. Ensign Yoshida, for night rations tonight we're having bean soup and dumplings. He probably found that out from a sailor his own age in the galley. His elated smile exposes all his teeth. Though side by side with older sailors, he is not mindful of their mental anguish. Though under the command of squad chief Miyazawa, he is not acquainted with his agony. Instead, he is wholly wrapped up in the thought of the special bean soup and dumplings, an overwhelming favourite among night rations. With much ado, he spreads the word that we're to have it barely ten hours from now. The plans call for us to charge into the enemy's midst at midnight tonight. If the hour for night rations finds us still OK, then the success of the operation will be beyond doubt, beyond doubt too, our deaths in the ensuing battle. That soup and dumplings, how will it taste? Thinking to drop in on Medical Officer Lieutenant Commander Ishizuka, I go to the emergency medical station at the very top of the bridge. His pale face bent over, he is deep in a technical book. How are you, sir? I ask silently. He nods. A poet rather than a doctor, a man of letters rather than a soldier, he likes to sit in a corner of the officer's wardroom, usually lost in thought. It is barely three months since he came on board Yamato attached to headquarters, but his genuineness has endeared him greatly to his fellows. Immediately before he came on board, he got married in Yokosuka, then hurried to his new posting. This I learned in putting the records in order after returning from the mission. His bride was a girl of seventeen. Later still, I was visited by his widow. She told me the following. At the time of the mission, she had travelled to Kura at the suggestion of her husband, and was staying at the home of an acquaintance. Several days before that day of the assault, on an afternoon of heavy rain, he had gone ashore to spend the few short hours until evening with her. They tended to fall silent. Was it only her imagination? And from time to time they looked long and hard into each other's eyes. The minutes flew, and it came time for him to return to the ship. When on parting she cajoled him, Can't you stay ashore longer next time? We could go for a hike somewhere. He suddenly took off his wristwatch and wrapped it firmly around her wrist. Naturally, she was agitated. When she put her own hand over his and looked up into his face, he said with a smile, Until I come next time, take care of this watch as you would of me. Without looking back, he walked quickly away. He must have known that the mission was not far off. She was too young to understand, trusting with a light heart in fate. She believed her husband's words and, carefree, simply awaited the day of his return. But far more painful to her than her own naivete in accepting unthinkingly the watch her husband was bequeathing to her was the fact that on April 7, 1945, at 2.30am, the exact moment of her husband's death in battle, she was laughing, enjoying herself. As it happened, she had gotten together with a few friends at the house of an acquaintance. She went out into the garden, which has an unbroken view of Cura Harbour, and without giving the least thought to her husband, amused herself happily. She ruse that fact, ruse it, but finds no peace. After that brief shore leave, Lieutenant Commander Ishizuka lost his next chance to go ashore because he was on duty, and his last chance too on the night before we sailed. He had to perform an emergency appendectomy and missed the last boat. That night, rare for him, he got drunk. Their actual married life, the day of the wedding and the day after. Before the mission, we gave free rein to our imaginations, thinking from comments of his overheard at odd moments that she was not his wife but his girlfriend, pure and innocent as a flower. Had we known, on the night of the final liberty, that he had summoned his new bride to Kura, we would certainly have forced him to switch his time on call and pushed him into the boat for sure. 
On his own initiative, he had given up that last chance. What had he sought in his young bride of seventeen? A noble beauty such as one dreams of, the purest love, innocent of reality, or the normal, natural, healthy instincts of a wife. Even had I known all this then, what words of sympathy could I possibly have spoken to his pale forehead, 9.45 a.m. hours on? I stand watch. Ah, who would have thought I would stand Yamato's last watch? The clouds lower steadily, the ceiling, 1,000 metres, wind velocity, over 20 knots. Sudden showers, keeping watches so difficult, and the duties of the watch are so important. I feel as if my cheeks are twitching. Is the tension so great, standing ramrod straight on the compass platform in the middle of the bridge, I grasp the binoculars in my sweaty hands. In front of me, and on both sides of me, are massed the mouths of the voice tubes to all parts of the ship. They look like a honeycomb. Many phone receivers hem my face in, and above them is the mouth of the large voice tube to the anti-aircraft command post, the captain's post during battle. I press down on the grating until the soles of my feet hurt. I keep a sharp lookout for submarines. Visibility is poor, down to below eight kilometres. With the binoculars, it is virtually impossible to spot periscopes, so great danger accompanies such conditions. We rely heavily on the operation of our surface radar, but by the standards of the Japanese Navy, the periscope must be at least one metre out of the water for three minutes for surface radar to pick it up. For actual combat that is far from adequate, we reach the spot designated for changing course. The distance between Asashimo and us is too great, and so, abandoning the idea of turning back and reintegrating her into the formation, we turn immediately onto compass course south-southwest. The bows of the ships now point directly at the enemy, lunch, battle rations. Leaning against the bulkhead, I hold the plate in one hand, the rice ball in the other. An unsettled meal, my last taste of rice. I'd like to think I can stay this calm and composed all day, but it's hard to be optimistic. Even as I am being assailed with dark premonitions, I eat this highly polished rice, this ceremonial food prepared with care. Indescribably delicious, my final treat, I sip the hot tea that fills my cup to the brim. It warms my throat and penetrates to my stomach. After the meal, peace and harmony reign. The captain at the centre. Such an atmosphere must be extremely rare even on a training cruise. Indeed on a cruise of any kind. Radar officer, out of the blue someone calls me. When I raise my head it is the captain. Yes sir. I remain at my watch post but move one step toward him. You stated that you're an only son, didn't you? That's right, sir. Several days before the mission, almost as if he foresaw this encounter, he sent around to all hands a list of questions about our family situations. I filled it out in detail and handed it in. At the bottom I wrote, I have no anxieties about the future. You wrote, I have no anxieties about the future. Is that true that he should remember anything about a mere ensign? I have no worries, sir. None at all. How should I respond? No, again, yes, I am unable to reply. When I look up, his face is crimson as if in anger, his lips pressed sternly together. But I see that for a fleeting moment his penetrating gaze is filled with sorrow, the famous captain, whose bravery and skill are legend. His nickname is Gorilla, and he has the respect and affection of all the officers and men. One night, shortly before the mission, as officer in charge of the last boat ashore, it reached the wharf at nine o'clock, I took the captain ashore, and three hours later at midnight, I brought him back to the ship in the first boat to pick up those on shore leave. At a time when enemy attacks were frequent, the captain could not be away from the ship for any length of time, so direct and broad-minded that he could relax and refresh himself in so short a time, I was unable to suppress a smile at the thought. They say that when he went out in peacetime, he always wore civilian attire, and that he had an endearing soft spot for beauty. If he saw a woman who took his eye, he would follow her to find out where she lived. I detect a gleam of gentleness even in the glances of his keen and high-spirited staff officers. It is not simply owing to the sense of ease, the languor brought on by full stomachs. It is a true sympathy they afford us who are going to our deaths within a few paces of them, a sympathy almost like that between blood relatives. From the Amami Oshima lookout comes a wireless message. 250 carrier-based enemy planes headed due north. Keep close watch. 
At 12 p.m. hours, we have just reached the halfway point. The entire task force advances serenely. The commander-in-chief looks to each side of him and smiles a broad smile. We got through the morning all right, didn't we? These are his first words since the mission began, when he took his seat in the commander-in-chief's chair, in front and to the right on the bridge. The sequence of alerts, the choice of zigzag, the speed, the changes of course. He has left everything to the captain of Yamato, and he has merely nodded silently in response to the reports of his chief of staff. From now on, until the ship capsizes, he will sit, arms folded, like a rock amid the smoke of the guns and the rain of bullets. All those around him will be killed or wounded, but he will move not at all. Was he too proud to assert control over this operation forced through over his opposition, opposition so strong he risked losing his command? Or was this his silent protest against the fate of being remembered as the highest-ranking officer of an operation that will live in naval annals for its recklessness and stupidity? A man of refreshing directness, the tall and graceful Admiral Ito, the battle begins at 12.20pm. Our air search radar picks up three blips, each apparently a large formation. In his usual guttural voice, Petty Officer Hasegawa, chief of the anti-aircraft radar room, gives a running commentary on their range and bearing, contacts. Three large formations approaching on the instant we send out emergency signals to every ship in the task force. Each ship increases its speed to 25 knots, as one they turn, 100 degrees exactly. Without changing its shape, the formation turns simultaneously onto a course of 100 degrees. Once the public address passes on word of the approaching planes, the ship, quiet already, becomes quieter still. As the radar tracks the blips, the data is transmitted to us moment by moment over the voice tube. Range 30,000 metres, bearing 160 degrees second raid. Range 25,000 metres, bearing 85 degrees. How many times in target practice have we conducted such tracking? I am possessed by the illusion that we have already experienced searches under the same conditions, with the same battle positions, even with the same mood. What is going on before my very eyes, indisputably, is actual combat, but how can I possibly convince myself of that fact? The blips are not an imagined enemy, but an enemy poised for the kill, the location, not our training waters, but hostile waters. Nevertheless, as I pass the reports along mechanically, I am nonchalant. Proceed too much by routine, a battle against aircraft, it is at hand. All the lookouts focus on the bearings of the approaching raids. At this moment, a light rain shrouds the ocean like a mist. Visibility is now at its worst. The moment we spot the American planes will probably be the moment they attack. At 12.32pm, the gruff voice of the second watch. Two Grummans, port 25 degrees, elevation 8 degrees, range 4,000 metres, moving right. Quickly I spot them with naked eye. The ceiling is between 1,000 and 1,500 metres. We have spotted them, but conditions are the worst possible. They are already too close. Aiming is very difficult. First raid. Five planes, more than ten planes, more than thirty. A large squadron appears out of a gap in the clouds. Every ten or twelve planes peel off in formation and make a sweeping turn to starboard. Dead ahead. Another large flight, already entering attack formation. More than 100 enemy planes attacking. Is it the navigation officer who calls this out? Inevitable that both torpedoes and bombs will focus on Yamato. The captain orders, Commence firing, 24 anti-aircraft guns and 120 machine guns open fire at the same moment. The main guns of the escort destroyers too flash in unison. The battle begins. Here and now we fire the first shots of this desperate death-inviting battle, my baptism by fire. I feel like puffing out my chest, and my legs want to dance. Restraining myself, I measure the weight pressing down on my knees. As my whole body tingles with excitement, I observe my own exhilaration. As I grit my teeth, I break into a grin. A sailor near me is felled by shrapnel. In the midst of the overwhelming noise, I distinguish the sound of his skull striking the bulkhead. Amid the smell of gunpowder all around, I smell blood. A shrill voice... The enemy is using both torpedoes and bombs. On the left outer edge of the formation, Hamakaze all of a sudden seems to expose her crimson belly, then lifts her stern up into the air. 
She sinks in a matter of only twenty or thirty seconds. She leaves behind only a sheet of white foam. Of her crew, those who happen to be above decks fall into the water, blown off by the impact of the torpedoes and the blast of the exploding ship. I understand that a good several dozen survivors drifted about for five hours on the periphery of the desperate air battle. According to the story afterward of Hamakaze's senior officer, equivalent to executive officer, what led to her sinking was a slight hitch in taking evasive action. Destroyers under attack use their agility and slender beam to evade torpedoes and bombs spotted with the naked eye. The captain sits atop the forward con and is responsible for the front half of the ship. The senior officer sits atop the aft deckhouse, responsible for the stern half. In close coordination, the two spot each torpedo and bomb coming toward them and, tracking them with the naked eye, take evasive action. Close cooperation between these two commanders, and in particular the skill and decisiveness of the captain, are the keys to survival. On this day, when the first American squadron swooped down out of the clouds, something suffocating, overpowering, filled Hamakaze. Such a thing had never happened before to Hamakaze, which had fought widely in southern waters. Just as the first torpedo came at the ship from astern, throwing up a pillar of spray as it hit the water, in that instant, for less than a second, the senior officer was transfixed by it and simply watched it come. And perhaps because he was slow to inform the captain and the ship could dodge only a bit, the torpedo hit her in the stern and blew away the rudder. In almost no time thereafter, bombs landed one after another on the disabled ship. She was enveloped in columns of water, pillars of fire. The tracks of the torpedoes are a beautiful white against the water, as if someone were drawing a needle through the water. They come pressing in, aimed at Yamato from a dozen different directions and intersecting silently. Estimating by sight their distance and angle on the plotting board, we shift course to run parallel to the torpedoes and barely succeed in dodging them. We deal first with the closest, most urgent one. When we get to a point far enough away from it that we can be sure we have dodged it, we turn to the next. Dealing with them calls for vigilance, calculation and decision. The captain is out in the open in the anti-aircraft command post overlooking the whole ship. Two ensigns attend him and plot on the manoeuvre board the torpedoes coming from all directions, indicating them to him with pointers. The navigation officer sits in the captain's seat on the bridge. Acting as one, the two men operate the ship, coming over the voice tube. The captain's orders deafen me. His is a terrible and angry voice, biting off the ends of words, bombs, bullets focus on the bridge, opening her engines with their 150,000 horsepower to full throttle, straining at her top battle speed of 27 knots, and turning her rudders hard to either side, Yamato continues her desperate evasive manoeuvres. This ship boasts of being as stable on open sea as on terra firma. Even so, she experiences extreme listing and vibration. The creaking of her hull and the grating of her fittings make a din. Before we know it, we have dodged several torpedoes. At last, we take one hit on the port bow. The first wave of enemy attackers flies off. There is virtually no list, but bombs have made two direct hits near the aft tower. The American planes are in the main Grumman F-6Fs, fighter planes, TBFs, torpedo bombers and Curtis SB-2CS bombers. Most of their bombs are probably 25s, 250 kilo bombs. The tracks of the torpedoes are obvious and easy to spot. But aren't they somewhat faster than the torpedoes we've seen before? Thus, the navigation officer. He looks to both sides and says with a smile, One torpedo finally got us, didn't it? No one responds. A very skillful attack, to judge by their dexterity in dodging our anti-aircraft fire and their fearlessness in taking aim. These must be the elite of the American forces. Thus, the Chief of Staff, the Admiral, face kindly as always, sits with arms folded, absolutely motionless. The Chief of Staff, all smiles, praises the enemy rather cheerfully. Litter bearers carry three bodies almost stealthily from the bridge. Bullets must have gotten them, stealing glances at that scene and ashamed and angry because of my poor form in doing so. I feel a touch of self-pity as well. Things return to a momentary tranquillity. The mood of friendly chatter is very similar to what we feel on completing a drill. The radar compartment takes a bomb. 
A messenger from the chief of the fire control division in a high-pitched voice. The aft radar compartment appears to have taken a hit. Investigate the damage and report immediately. The aft radar compartment, the anti-aircraft director. It is one of my posts. Had I not happened to be on deck watch, I might have been on duty there. Lieutenant Amori, chief radar officer, whom I have just relieved on watch, apparently headed straight there. The boyish face of Lieutenant Omori, the bittersweet smile of Petty Officer Hasegawa, chief of the radar compartment, and the faces of many of their subordinates appear before my mind's eye as I run to the ladder at the aft side of the bridge and start down. To the right of the rail, as if eating into the iron bulkhead, a chunk of flesh. I brush it off with my elbow and it goes sliding away. Hey, radar outside, you'll never make it for the bullets. Take the inside route. It is a junior signal officer calling from atop the flag deck. His sharp voice cuts through the rain of bullets and strikes my ear. He is kind enough to worry lest I throw my life away, even as busy as he is. Thanks. I turn my head and with my hand signal Roger, but there is no time to do as he advises. Climbing down through the inside of the bridge would be safer, but it takes time to open the doors dogged down for battle. That wouldn't suit this emergency. It's my duty and many shipmates have died already in my stead. Sliding down the upright ladder, twenty metres tall, in a flash I run. The smell of gunpowder assails my nose. I have scraped the palms of my hands badly on the sides of the ladder, and the skinned places burn painfully. An officer who stands exposed from the chest up in a side machine gun turret happens to look around. Our eyes meet as I run, Ensign Takada, my classmate. With his iron helmet down over his eyes, his swarthy face smiling, he calls in his Osaka dialect, take care now, and waves his pointer. Answering promptly, Wilco, I run past without a glance. Who would have thought that this was to be my last sight of you, you son of a good Osaka family, you? As I'm about to rush past bomb damage at the base of the funnel, I meet Ensign Sukeda of the same division. Blood drips from two spots on his white headband. Leaning on a cane, he can barely walk. His post is the aft secondary fire control command post. It took a direct hit. No one doubted that all the men were killed. How did he escape death? Not giving in to his severe wounds, he must be on his way to make his report. He is always affable and sweet-tempered, but he throws me only a brief sharp glance. With rain gear in tatters and shoulders hunched, his slight figure seen from behind makes a pathetic sight, perhaps because he has lost so much blood he is so done in that I cannot bear to look at him. When he has reported and lets up, he'll probably simply collapse. Silently nodding to him, I hurry on. I race to the area forward of the radar compartment, not a trace of the ladder. I summon a deck hand and climb down a line. The anti-aircraft radar compartment, solid and safe, it was about three metres on a side and had steel bulkheads on all four sides, but the bomb has split it cleanly in two and blown away the upper half. It is as if someone had taken an axe and split a bamboo tube. The bomb, a direct hit, must have sliced way in at an angle and then exploded. Tuned and retuned in preparation for today's decisive battle, the instruments have been scattered in all directions. I don't recognise the debris, not even any pieces left, just as I begin to think that everything must have been blown away. I notice a chunk of flesh smashed onto a panel of the broken bulkhead, a red barrel of flesh about as big around as two arms can reach. It must be a torso from which all extremities, arms, legs, head have been ripped off, noticing four hunks scattered nearby. I pick them up and set them in front of me. To the charred flesh are stuck here and there pieces of khaki-coloured material, apparently scraps of military uniform. The smell of fat is heavy in the air. It goes without saying that I cannot tell where head and arms and legs might have been attached, that it should be impossible to tell one corpse from another. As I lift them, they are still hot from burning. When I run my hand over them, they feel like the bark of a rough tree. My fellow officers and men who were alive and at work here until a few minutes ago, and these hunks of flesh, one and the same, separated only by time. How can I believe that, the lives lodged in these four bodies? Where have they gone? The other eight men have been completely blown away. Not even the stench of their deaths is left to float in the air. What emptiness! How did they die, those beings who only a moment ago were so real? I cannot stop doubting, stop marvelling. 
It is not grief and resentment. It is not fear. It is total disbelief, as I touch these hunks of flesh. For a moment I am completely lost in thought. A wave of sound comes smashing toward me from astern. My legs tremble ominously. I look up into the attack of the second wave, coming in from the stern on the port side. For shame I have duties on the bridge. This isn't the place for me to die. Already I feel the concussion from bombs exploding. Soon a cloud of bullets will engulf me. Head down, with one hand touching the handrail. I make a mad dash. My eyes see nothing at all. The ship is steaming at full speed, and wind stirred up by her forward motion surges along the whole passageway. Just as I start to scramble up the ladder at the base of the main tower, my eyes go taut, perhaps because my whole body is so keyed up. No sign of that machine gun mount, Ensign Takada's post. Heartsick, I turn my head and stare with wide open eyes. A great gouged out spot and clouds of white smoke boiling up out of it. That is all. People, guns, mount in one instant, wiped out without a trace. Ensign Takada, forgive me a moment ago, you shouted encouragement to me through the rain of bullets, but I was caught up in the danger to my men and did not respond. I ran on past without even a word of reply, that you have met such a cruel death. Is it because I was remiss in encouraging you? You who were a good man and true, so adept at keeping everyone else's glass full, you of the white teeth, who often broke into a loud laugh. With eyes squeezed shut, I race up the ladder. Had I passed that spot twenty or thirty seconds earlier, the blast of the direct hit would have enveloped me, and you and I would have died together. I rush up the ladder, spurring on my daunted self, whipping up my hostility, repeating in a loud voice the report I must deliver to the division officer. All crew dead, instruments completely destroyed, compartment unusable. Even at its loudest, my voice is lost in the sounds of destruction, the din, the shouting is necessary to spur myself on. Bullets ping at my back, their blasts fan my waist. I report immediately to the division officer, the air search radar, a crucial weapon of our defence against planes, has thus been destroyed at the start of the battle. The enemy planes, pressing in on us out of a dark sky, we confront with only our unaided eyesight. A low voice whispering deep in my ear is so faint it seems on the point of fading away. The voice of Lieutenant Omori, senior radar officer, which came over the phone just before I took the watch three hours ago. His last words linger in my ear. You, Ensign Yoshida, I've given you nothing but difficult tasks. Made you work sorry for that, not so. It's I who was remiss, you, you. The voice does not stop, it whispers, as if in reproach. He's already fallen, dead. How can I possibly respond? Lieutenant Usubuchi, in charge of the aft secondary guns, is killed by a direct hit. The young warrior, who was both wise and courageous, leaves behind not one bit of flesh, not one drop of blood. He hoped, by dying to awaken new life, his body, offered up in the cause of a genuine national rebirth, has disappeared into thin air. The fierce assault. The second wave, too. More than 100 planes from the port beam, mainly torpedo bombers. Seeing that the covering fire of cruiser Yahagi is fierce and accurate, one group of the attacking planes heads for her. Twenty torpedo tracks head toward Yamato. We take three hits on the port side, in the neighbourhood of the aft tower. Part of the auxiliary rudder sustains damage. The overwhelming number of torpedoes has made it impossible, even with this ship's agility, to dodge them all. A veritable circle of fire closes in on us from above, from all points of the compass, glistening. The curtain of anti-aircraft fire Yamato throws up is without parallel in our navy. With its carpet of explosions in brilliant red, purple, yellow and green, it is not an insignificant menace, but its power to intimidate and destroy is far less than we had supposed. Conceding from the outset that the sacrifice of some planes is inevitable, the American formation discards roundabout tactics to evade the curtain of bullets. Instead, it surges straight ahead, an avalanche on the course best suited for taking aim. Not only the fighter planes and bombers, attacking at a steep downward angle, but even the torpedo bombers, attacking at a gentle angle of descent, zigzag as soon as they have dropped their payloads and evading our flak, carry out close-range strafing. Moreover, discarding the ironclad rule that one attacks at a steep angle from a height of 3,000 metres, they adapt to conditions, 
shifting to shallower dives that make use of the heavy clouds, very original on their part.